You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth, the show that is honest, reveals the facts, truth, and statistics, and does not mess around. Follow me, Taylor Phillips, on Twitter at DT2Phillips. Email me at TaylorGatorPhillips14 at Yahoo.com. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter at EdSmith313. And go to our website at MichiganSportsTruth.com. Also like our Facebook page, The Michigan Sports Truth, and join our Facebook group with the same name. The Michigan Sports Truth podcast on Spreaker is also available Available on iHeartRadio and SoundCloud. Also a subsidiary of Sports Radio Detroit, thus available on iTunes and Podbean. This podcast is particularly not for entertainment purposes, and the views expressed by the host of this podcast are opinion-based. However, they do not come without facts, research, statistics, and truth, whether other people like it or not, and no matter how harsh or complicated it may be. This is the Michigan Sports Truth, and nothing can ever stop it from being correct. And welcome to episode 262 of the Michigan Sports Truth Spreaker Week in Review. I'm Taylor Phillips. Welcome back, Ed Smith. How are we doing tonight, Ed? I'm doing quite well, Taylor. You know, after quick uh, adjustment of, of, of background. Yeah, this is the... Hey, Ed, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Clear? Yeah, we're on. Yeah, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing quite fine, Taylor. After uh, you know, a bit of a circumstantial week, it's, uh, it's safe to say that I'm back and ready to report for duty. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, I-, I actually got out of work. I had so much to do. Ruby Tuesday. Hell, hell I love the damn job. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Hey, work is work. Oh, I'm yeah. Long it's a paycheck. Oh, yeah. That's good for, good for us to be nocturnal, right? All right, well, got a ton to discuss here. Not much to recap except for the Tigers and the Lions in the NFL draft. Also got to talk about talk about a little bit of Red Wings, Griffins, um, also the Michigan Wolverines and the Michigan State Spartans. Got a couple notes each on uh, Michigan, the uh, Michigan State uh Spartans, including Austin Robertson. Also, Jabril Peppers uh, testing positive for dilute substances before being drafted late in the first round. Not to mention the Griffins sweeping the Milwaukee Ad- Admirals and moving on to play the Chicago Wolves starting Wednesday in the second round of the AHL Calder Cup Finals. So, in case we have technical difficulties, we apologize. Um, let's uh, start off with Tigers here. That one is long gone. They crushed the Seattle Mariners nineteen to nine in the first of the three of the three game set. That is the first time in a long time that the Tigers have have scored. Like that, 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 actually, I take that back. That that's uh, that's a, a a record. That's that ties the record for the for the most runs at Comer- the Tigers have ever scored at Comerica Park. Plus, it, it's the it's the first time since August tenth through the twelfth of nineteen ninety three at the Old Tiger Stadium since the Tigers have scored at least thirteen runs. Jordan Zimmerman, despite giving up five runs, got the win. Got bailed out by a a truckload of run support. Built by a great Tigers lineup, filling in for an injured Miguel Cabrera and J.D. Martinez. And then James Paxton, in the second game, they get shut out by James Paxton and the rest of the Mariners, 8 nothing. 
and then Francisco Rodriguez gives up the game-winning run at the top of the ninth, and the Mariners win 2-1. to one. And then the, the Tigers continue their losing ways, 7-3 to three to the Chicago White Sox. <coughs> and then... <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> then six to four in ten. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of allergies here. Apologies. Six to four in ten innings to the White Sox. It, Victor Martinez finally hits a home run. Finishes three for his previous eight before Sunday afternoon. Going into Sunday afternoon, but Justin Wilson finally gives up two runs after pitching a. Z- a triple zero ERA, but that, but that uh, obviously proved costly in the tenth inning, and the White Sox won six to four in ten innings, and Justin Wilson unfortunately took the loss, and and then the Tigers beat back the Chicago White Sox seven to three. Jordan Zimmerman had a little bit better outing than his last against the Seattle Mariners. He only gave up three runs on. Five hits and seven innings pitched. The Tigers uh, gave him just enough run support to give him the win. The rest of the bullpen, including Alex Wilson, got the job done. Now, Brad Osmus is still hitting Victor Martinez fourth. Victor, despite hitting three for his three for eight in, in uh, Fridays and Saturdays games combined. Sunday he goes over three. That that three for previous eight was just too good to be true. Yeah, that seemed to be an illusion more than anything. And by the way, it's like correction tale. I think he went over four. Over four. Yeah. Uh, of course, no RBIs, um, and of course, a strike. I think he left at least um, six. I'm losing you. Okay. It was Will's on his way to pulling with Jeff Moss. Yeah, Lemar was on his way to pulling what Jeff Moss described was a perfect layered, uh, an honor in, in, in. Damn it, come on. Yeah, Victor Mont- Yeah, perfect layered. By the way, Jeff Inter- Moss is the uh, founder and editor in chief of the Detroit Sports Rag. You can follow Jeff Moss on Twitter at. Jeff Moss DSR and like his Facebook page, DetroitSportsRag.com. The perfect Gerald Laird. Yeah, I mean it's 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 it was it was not quite the, the whole the whole enchilada, but it, it was a, it was a sliver of an attempt. So there's one thing that that B Mart has been useful for it is being absolutely useless. Yep, that's true. But still, shame on Austin for still putting him at fourth. It's just, I understand if you got to bat him somewhere in the lineup because of all the amount of money you're paying him, but it doesn't deserve to be bad and clean up. Just enough, it deserves to be bad and clean up. Way more than V-Mart has been doing as of late. Yeah. It's, um, Victor Martinez has now become a laughing stock. While he's aging, and Brad Osmus still being the lazy Dartmouth mimbo imbecile that he is. <laughs> Plus, um, Brad Osmus uh, didn't uh, started not to play Andrew Romine any any more in con- consecutive games, but uh, the. But uh, the Tigers' offense in those four losses, they only scored eight runs in their last in that four-game losing streak span before beating the White Sox seven to three. Shane Green, uh, by the way, as we look out for him, he he's done a tremendous job in the bullpen. Alex Wilson has done great. Justin Wilson, despite giving up those two those two uh, game game winning runs in the top of the tenth, the home run by Miguel by Melky Cabrera, for example, 
and obviously El Garcia with the RBI triple, the former Tiger. Justin Wilson has still done a hell of a job, but um, he, he is coming off a rough outing, giving up those two runs in the 10th inning. I don't know if that's, that sets his tone, or uh, I, I'm not sure if he can bounce back. Well, only time will tell. I think, just, I think it was just a, a, a rare off day for him. I think he's been very yeah. consistently well up to this point. Uh, it was just a, a minor hiccup. Uh, I think it's nothing too much to be worried, too worried about. Right, except it proved costly in that game. Tigers came back yeah, game, to tie it up for that game. Yeah, for that game, it was it was bad timing, but uh, I think he'll 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 do much better next outing. Me too. Me too. So, other notes: a week ago, Matt Boyd was fined an undisclosed amount of money for intentionally throwing a pitch behind first baseman Miguel Miguel Sano of the Minnesota Twins. Now, it all started when. Jacoby Jones took a took a pitch in the mouth, and he was bleeding, and he had to be put on the ten day disabled list. Jose Iglesias was reinstated. By the way, speaking of injuries, um, Iglesias got back in the lineup, but um, that hit that hit by pitch that Jones took in the mouth um, that that ju- that just puts another uh, key player on the disabled list. Miguel Cabrera. J.D. Martinez, Jose Iglesias, but now he's back in there, and now, but now Jacoby Jones. Still no timetable on when Jacoby Jones will be back af- after his 10-day disabled list waiting. But um, well, I do know he was either, well. Uh, I do know I think either yesterday or the day, today or yesterday or even the day before uh, he did begin a rehab assignment in Toledo, so that must mean he'll be back up very shortly. That's good. Good eye on that one. Uh-huh. But uh, Matt Boyd throwing that pitch behind Miguel Sano was, was uh, clearly retaliation. The home plate umpire. Uh, well, first off, Miguel Sano was held back back by James McCann, and then Sano gave James McCann a slug right to the to the upper chest, and then the home plate umpire Jordan Baker ejected Miguel Sano, and then, and then uh, moments later, Matt Boyd was ejected by Jordan Baker simply because of that retaliation pitch. And, and, and it was no doubt Matt Boyd had to be ejected. I mean, I mean, you gotta, you gotta play the game. You can't retaliate. It, Accidents happen. By, by, the, by the rule, no, some he shouldn't have done, but I don't mind it because it was just him standing up for his teammate. That speaks, that lets you know that hey, this is, it speaks, it lends a little bit of character to the team. Let them know, hey, if you go after one of our own, we'll stand up for each other. So I do appreciate that that aspect, at least. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of like that. Boyd, Boyd still would have got the win had he uh, continued to, Continue his uh, his you know um, his outing. Only gave up three runs, but um, it's not too terrible. But um, again, rules are rules. I don't mind stick. I don't mind a, a guy sticking up for his teammates, but. If someone disagrees with the rules, they they have a, they have problems. So it's that simple. So the Tigers coming out off that seven three win over the White Sox, salvaging that finale of that three game series. They welcome in the Cleveland Indians for four games. The Tigers, last I saw. We're uh, in fourth place after Saturday. I, th- I think they might have jumped in back into third place. Can you check the standings for, for me real quick, Ed? I'm going to read the upcoming schedule. The the Indians come for uh, for four games, and then um, the Tigers head to Oakland, 10:05, 9:05, and 4:05 to play the Athletics. 
start a nine game road trip. They have next Monday off and then go to Arizona at 940 to play the Diamondbacks Tuesday and Wednesday. And then next week, Thursday through Sunday, they're in Anaheim against the Los Angeles Angels before they return back home. By the way, standings update, they are still currently in fourth place, uh, but they're only two games behind Cleveland, uh, who was the division leader at this time. So yeah. fourth place behind Chicago, technically, but the Tigers are only two games behind Cleveland for the division lead. I assume the American League Central Division standings were still so close. Yeah, Cleveland's at 14 and 10. And like I said, I mentioned we're already two games back, so that means we're at 500 at 12 and 12. It'll, it'll sure be a close battle for that first place lead. But there but there are also so the White so, Sox so and the Royals. Good. Yeah, but I think you, you would have to assume that due to the injuries to Cabrera and J.D. Martinez, if those two players were playing for Detroit right now, it's safe to assume that maybe the Tigers, you know, Malign bullpen and all, they probably would have at least a share of the division lead just just because, you know, we're, do, we're this close without making a JD so far. Got to keep an eye on them. JD is getting even healthier. Miguel Cabrera is getting even healthier. We're going to keep an eye on those two. JD, unless I had less, I read it out, they should be back by around mid May, pass at the latest, it assumed. I assume yeah. that, that would be the side table. Wow, yeah. Still can't rush it, but that's a, that's an even longer time than I expected. Miguel Cabrera, any update on him? Miguel Cabrera. Uh, he's been following uh, his DL schedule as, 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 as planned. All right. Might return just a few games or maybe a couple. So, covered all Tigers, and now we're going to recap the Lions in the NFL draft. 2017. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! All right, the list goes like this. The lineback, uh, the Lions in the first round have drafted linebacker Jared Davis from the Florida Gators at number 21. Most most fans wanted linebacker Reuben Foster from Alabama, but two reasons the Lions didn't want him. Foster had to take a drug test, and then he had shoulder problems at, along the same way along the way. So that's why they, they selected linebacker Jared Davis. He's healthier and more righteous. He didn't take a drug test, and he doesn't have any injuries right now. As for Foster, Foster fell to 31, and he was picked by the San Francisco 49ers. But your thoughts on that? Um, it seemed to be like this was the right move to make for not only need purposes, but also death purposes as well. Um, Foster seemed to be the sexier pick because it's the more recognizable name. But I think as long as this turns out to be the right way, you know, we can look back and say this was the right pick to make. Uh, like I mentioned before, need uh, with the, 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 the departure of DeAndre Levy this off season, um, Detroit needed to fill out its linebacking spot, linebacker position. Uh, did that not just with this pick, but with the, the fourth round selection as well. We'll get to in a second. Uh, but it's clear, you know, from the get go, early on, we need to establish some sort of need to replenish our defense. You know, we spent a good portion on, on, on uh, of our off season re- upgrading our offensive line, which was a needed uh, uh, boost to, to to have on our offense. Now we need to focus our attention more to fixing our defense, so I appreciate the, the route and direction uh, that Quinn was doing with not only this this first-round selection, but also the second-round selection as well. And then the second round, speaking of which, the Lions have drafted a, a secondary defender, a cornerback, Tease Tabor, from the Florida Gators at number 53. Your thoughts on that? Wow, uh, again, this was also a much needed position because I think eventually you need to get yourself a quarterback that can either A, line up opposite field of uh, 
Darius Slay, which conveniently enough, I believe that was what the NFL.com comparison model has it towards anyway as a model of sorts would be another Darius Slay. So it's kind of good to have two of those on the same team in a way. Um, or you can put them at the slot back, you know, knowing that you got guys like uh, 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 Nevin uh, Tossin or something like that. Levin, Nelson Levin, I'm sorry, I lost his name at the moment, but I know there's DJ Hayden also in the secondary as well. Um, so it, it adds me to depth uh, to a position I thought that was a little bit thin and a little bit of a weakness as well at last season, some spurts. Um, and I'm like, he may not be as fast, but I think you, you trade up some of that trade off some of that speed uh, for the instincts uh, from and it gives you a, a, a nice presence on uh, on that side of the field as well. So I'm very glad that they went after this need. Again, I probably would have taken Jordan Lewis, but again, just like they mirrored in the first round, um, they decided to go with with a need, but take substance over flash in, in a sense. So um, I'm, I have no problem, no qualms with, with this pick at all. Me neither. I, I think that was a good choice. The Lions needed to address their secondary defense. It wasn't the only cornerback the Lions would would draft, but they what? But but first off, they drafted wide receiver Kenny Galladay from Northern Illinois in the Huskies at number ninety six. Now you pointed out off the air a bit earlier the uh, in the weekend that uh, he could possibly re- replace Calvin Johnson. And that's possible. Yeah, I, could, I mentioned that in, in the sense that he gives you, a, yeah, he gives you a big target, a red zone threat. Uh, the kid's six four. He's got a thirty two inch leap at, at the very least. He's got reliable hands. This is something that Lions fans could take some solace in. You know, knowing the amount of balls that were that passes, catchable passes that were dropped last year. I believe um, in this past, you know, in his seasons. Uh, during his play in college the past couple of years or whatever, Galloway had about over 165 catchable passes thrown his way, and the number of drops were in the single digits, like five to eight, or that's some, some uh, that type of similar ratio. So very reliable, dependable hand, something that you need in a red zone situation. Like I mentioned, with his height and his size, he's six foot four. Uh, you you add that between potentially um, uh, Eric Ebron and maybe and also. Well, we're going to talk about a couple of seconds. Michael Roberts as well gives you a multitude of red zone targets for a guy like Matthew Stafford to use at, at his given call, which can be a little bit terrifying if you're a defender and you're or you're a cornerback or someone in the secondary that, that's shorter in height stature compared to these to these dudes that's going to be lining up against you. So again, uh, uh, it seems like uh, an under the radar pick now, but long term, as in terms of in terms of developing. Uh, as adding a needed tool to the Lions offense, um, I think a very fine pick. That and, and the pick we're going to see uh, uh, and with the second, fourth round selection. And then we go to the fourth round, the Lions pick two. First off, another linebacker, Jalen Reeves, Maven from Tennessee at 124, and then a tight end, Michael Roberts from Toledo at 127. Pr- probably may. First off, Jalen Reeves, Maven, another linebacker. The Lions starting starting to build up their defensive line, and then Michael Roberts could possibly, in the future, one day replace Eric Ebron. Eric Ebron. Yeah, either replace Ebron or be a very uh, uh, very serviceable uh, number two tight end option. Um, as for uh, Reeves Maven, um, one thing I forgot to mention about Davis, uh, looking at some of his film, he is a hard downhill runner, so that would be very essential, great in terms of playing up holes and stopping the run, so he could be very effective in that one. Uh, Reeves Maven has some okay speed of his, of his own as well. Six foot, 230, he ran a 4.640 dash, um, very okay. K numbers. He had 20 tackles last season playing for uh, the Tennessee Volunteers. So he seems to be one that can help you out in terms of 
uh, the pass coverage, whereas Davis can be your more run stopper focus of the two linebackers. Uh, like you mentioned for Michael Thomas, uh, he, he would be the, the future replacement for Eric Ebron if things don't turn out so well. Uh, I think Ebron, you know, what Ebron may lack in terms of better red zone threat that Roberts possess, uh, Ebron makes up for. Excuse me with this athleticism, but even still, uh, the man Robert size, almost 6'5", or 270, has no surprise he had the amount of receptions and touchdown ratios that he had during his college year. So I look at him, like I said, between Ebron um, and eventually Galloway, uh, or, or Galloway, I should say, uh, if, if you're not so sure about uh, Anquan Bolden coming back, these are some nice options to, to give you in terms of size alone in the red zone, let alone you know, plugging in uh, a Marvin Jones or, or a Golden Tate in the slot speed to balance out some route bang underneath. So, again, uh, these are eventual, these were two additions in the job I think could eventually turn out to be big uh, big dividends for the Lions offense in terms of red zone production uh, in the long term as we look at things here. Now, the fifth round, the other cornerback, Jamal Agnew at 165 from San Diego. What do you see in that guy? I see him a guy you can fit into the slot or the nickel um, between him or, uh, or, or uh, Tabor. Uh, Tabor, I think, eventually is going to be your outside, opposite field uh, uh, cornerback, whereas uh, Agnew can be more your slot focused back. Uh, figure out some speed and the routes underneath. Uh, again, this is a, a move that was needed to add depth and consideration. Um, I have no problem with this whatsoever. We, we have, there's a, a ton, a ton of cornerbacks and, and secondary people that were taken in this draft. Like 30 or so um, prospects that were taken in this draft were from the secondary. So uh, you'll literally pick one really can't go wrong. Also, he's got a 4 3 two, 40 time, so he's got some, again, proves his speed that can really help him out and, and, and running with guys in the slot and underneath routes. So, uh, another good, pick, another very good pick in my, in my view. Oh, yeah. So, Bob Quinn still addressing that secondary defense issue. Pick, pick two quarterbacks better than one. Hey, I like that. And then in the sec- seventh round, that's the sixth round actually, 205 defensive end Jeremiah Ledbetter from Arkansas. Bob Quinn goes back to the, uh, to the defensive line. And he's not even done yet. Which I felt was practically... Yeah, which I felt was practically the only thing he needed to do. Uh, I thought it was something, it was one on my list of things that we need to tack off. Um, while I thought our, our, our defense all out was okay last year, it still needed, uh, was still lacking, I should say, uh, that force of forcing pressure and getting to the quarterback. So in terms of getting a pass rusher or something to help complement Ziggy Hans, uh, uh, you saw it in here at least that, uh, with the later portion of, of, of our draft pick. So you do get in Ledbetter a guy who had sufficient success in Arkansas and, of course, playing in that rugged SEC. You know, it's the defense, the defensive players really do stand out above the rest in some instances. So that's what you're hoping for in this instance with, with Ledbetter. And finally, another defensive end, 250 in the seventh round, Eastern Michigan Eagle, Pat O'Connor to conclude the list. Well, O'Connor, he had, O'Connor he had 20 sacks in his collegiate career. He's a guy that can be used for rotation purposes. Um, you could switch him out but with uh, an Anthony Zettel, for instance, or, or, or an Armonte Bryant. If, even if you don't bring an Armonte Bryant back, you can still rotation him out with, with Zettel and again, for, for depth purposes or, 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 you know, help give Ziggy or, or uh, or whoever would be on that line, uh, a rest for, 
for a down or two. So this was merely done for death purposes. But I do like I uh, do like the attention to detail, trying to make sure, hey, we didn't have so much of a, of a pass rush presence. Let's try to plug that up as much as possible by getting some, some defensive ends here. I mean, you did you did pretty good because you know he had guys like Kerry Hyder, for example, uh, really shout out. Uh, but he did it more from the interior. You need more edge rusher help. And with Ziggy being double teamed all the time, you know, you're probably going to need another guy from, from uh, another edge rusher to come in and do some work. So with one of these two picks, you hope something, you can find a good diamond from the rough here. Yeah, I have to agree with that one. So that's, that's the list of the uh, players that the Lions drafted from the college level. And speaking of the well, college, we can't forget, well, well, one second, we can't forget one player. Oh yeah, the undrafted. Oh, the yeah, two the players actually, and the the undrafted free agents, right? No, well, I can't remember the undrafted free agents, but remember their second six round selection uh, that they made. It was Brad Kaya, the quarterback from Miami. Yeah, that's right. He, yeah, he he was he's going to do it with uh, with Jake with Jake Rock Jake Rudock. The former Michigan Wolverine for that backup quarterback spot, yeah. Yeah, most likely. Fun fact, you know, for those that may not know, his mother uh, was the woman who portrayed the character Felicia in the Ice Cube movie Friday all those years back. So, you know, you know the phrase, by Felicia, that's where that movie comes from. That's who the character was. And now how convenient, all these years later, her son is now in the NFL. So congrats to her, congrats to him, congrats to the whole family. Absolutely. So, in a, so Bob Quinn firing on all, all cylinders. We're going to bottle it up and use that as one of our five questions at the end of the program. Speaking of college football, Touchdown, Michigan! early in the week, cornerback Jabril Peppers tested positive for a diluted substance, and he will enter the drug the NFL drug program. And despite all that, he was still selected late in the first round. Your thoughts on that? Well, on the, on the issue of his positive test, you know, it could be something, excuse me, something similar to what we saw with Ruben Foster. Uh, Foster, I believe had some of similar reports to where he was, she was very, uh, dehydrated at either during or after doing his activity, either at the combine or at a pro day or something uh, to that effect. So, due to that, it probably they had to take a supplement or a, a prescription to help combat his, his dehydration issues, and that probably is what led to the diluted sample test. Same thing here with Peppers. Um, we haven't heard any rumors or any suspicion of him having any type of performance enhancing drug issue, whether it be you know, recreational or not, or any type of drug, you know, period. So this may be a similar case with Foster. Peppers was dealing with dehydration in his own way, probably took a prescription or, or not prescription, but some a supplement that helped deal with that, and that's what produced the test. Other than that, uh, it's really not too much to worry. Besides, it really didn't affect too much of his stop because he still won in the first round. And then, just going to mention this, former Wolverine defensive tackle Jake Long retires from the NFL. So, uh, yeah, Jake, you know, he went the number one, uh, overall selection to the Dolphins in the 08. He had a very productive and stellar career, had a couple of pro bowl selections, uh, didn't quite pan out too much, but still out there. I think he had a still a productive career and he's got the number one overall draft, uh, Mark to hang on his mantle, to hang on his resume. So, congrats to Jake on a, on, on a, uh, on a, on a even, even out uh, career and, uh, enjoy all the retirement. Um, now in terms of Michigan general, it's worth noting that I believe they had 11 draft, 11 players selected overall in this entire draft. So a, that says something about the job that Jim Harbaugh and company had done uh, with this team last year. And B as a quick note, I think that's the most of any Big Ten team has selected since Ohio State in around the mid-80s, I believe, 1985, that type of deal. So uh, um, outstanding effort by what Michigan has done now really gives questions to what, what can this team produce after losing so much of that talent from last year 
how can they do for this year? So it does leave you a very intriguing question mark for this upcoming season. Absolutely. Then on the other hand, touchdown MSU! Michigan State Spartans football defensive tackle Austin Robertson was arraigned and held on a $250,000 bond. He was dismissed uh, the other week. He was dismissed uh, amid the sexual assault in, in, in investigation. So there were three players. There were th- there were there are three players left to be named yet, but. Um, there were a total of four players suspended indefinitely, and now one of them, Austin Robertson, has, has been kicked off, dismissed, and and now arraigned and held on a two hundred fifty thousand dollar bond. He he's serving he's serving a legal punishment now. Not to mention there was also a staff member, I believe, that was uh, suspended as well. Holy so, shit! Very, yeah, so very very bad bad timing PR-wise for Michigan State as a university in general, not just uh, with this scandal going on, with, with this issue with the football program, but also, of course, the Larry Nassar uh, scandal with that's currently going on as well. Um, and as well as you got to feel for Mark D'Antonio in this instance because, you know, coming off of a three and nine season, I'm sure you, the thing that you want to talk about the most more importantly was how can this team as in general improve on the field instead he most likely has to you know he's got to spend most of his time dealing with all this stuff that's gone on off the field so uh this issue should be very distracting and um quite be quite, could be quite harrowing uh for even mark d'antoni to go through so it's you have to wonder how much can can this affect the coach and in turn uh, affect the whole school and, and the team for this season. Can they re- re- rebound um, and respond, or can they, or will they crumble underneath all this pressure even more? So again, it gives you another question uh, from a different perspective, and a more, you know, seems to be a more pessimistic in, in nature, but uh, uh, gives quite an intriguing question to look for Michigan State's side of things as opposed to Michigan. Sure enough. So that's football. Now we s- switch to hockey here. Well, the Red Wings hold on to their seventh overall draft pick in the NHL 2017, but now, according to the lottery, they fall to the ninth overall pick in the 2017 NHL draft lottery. Normally at that point, it's just it's just bad luck for the Red Wings, but but there's there also comes bad karma first for for winning meaningless and irrelevant games down the stretch in the season where the where the when the Red Wings are uh, bound to miss the playoffs for the first time in 26 years, which which they actually did finally. It it didn't it didn't phase Ken Holland. It didn't phase Jeff Blaschel. It sure as hell didn't phase Chris Ellich because he's he's over loyal with the Tigers and the Red Wings especially. Again, the Red Wings bottom out, but they're the they're the first team in years to enter to enter uh, one of the top fifteen NHL draft picks spots. It does seem like a big case of how the mighty have fallen, but you know it's. You, you, this was a situation that could have turned itself from bad to instantly positive because, you know, because of them meaning those winning those meaningless games, it most likely caught them a shot, cost them a chance to go top five, top three, maybe even grab the number one overall draft pick spot. Um, because I think there was an article out that Moss had retweeted some of the effect of the Wings were one or two moves or selections away from grabbing that top three or top overall selection. So it really makes you wonder, was winning all those dumb, meaningless games when you were already mathematically eliminated, you know, just for a better Joe Lewis send-off, was that all worth it in terms of, you know, costing you essentially this number one pick? Yeah, that article was was a four, that aforementioned article was published by Sportsnet's um, 
the, the Sportsnet staff at sportsnet.ca headlining the Canucks and the Red Wings were were one number off off winning the NHL draft lottery. Mikey Johnson was tweeting the Red Wings had one five six and thirteen. I'm not sure exactly how this whole draft lottery system works, but I, I, at least I saw it on television just to learn at least some of how it goes. The Red Mike Johnson also said the Red Wings were one number off that as well as five six eight and thirteen, and that and that's it. A little adding a little bit of comedy. Maybe they should consider trading for Taylor Hall. He tweeted. Halsey at Halsey09, officially added officially adding NHL lottery ball specialist to my hockey resume. And maybe it's not not necessarily comedy. Taylor Hall is actually actually accepting the damn job. Wow. So the Red Wings were all were one number each off of getting the first round pick and the second round pick. The, the first overall pick and the second second overall pick. Instead, they fall to nine place overall. Nine overall. Damn it! But, but again, karma bites them right in the ass. It's a bitch because the Red Wings not, not only are pathetic, you are pathetic, but they are uh, incompetent to the. They were incompetent to their tanking process. They they could have uh, they could have finished with a with a fourth NHL overall draft pick heading into the draft lottery. So speaking of uh, the Red Wings, their top AHL affiliate, the Grand Rapids Griffins have swept the Milwaukee Admirals. In game one, game one, they won four to three in overtime in Van Andel Arena. Game two, they won five to two. Game three at UW Milwaukee Panther Arena, they won three to two. Came back from down two to one. They're going to play the Chicago Wolves at Allstate Arena in Chicago Wednesday and Friday at eight o'clock on ESPN nine six one. Catch them on iHeartRadio. So that's all the hockey we uh, covered, and that that's all the Michigan sports material that we covered. So now we narrow it down to the segment that we call Five Questions. Ed, are you ready? Ready as you are, Tiz. Go ahead and let him rip. We've done this before. It's time for Five Questions on the Michigan Sports Truth. Question number one. Was linebacker Jared Davis a better pick than linebacker Reuben Foster? I say yes, because uh, Davis, if he has any type of injury, is nowhere near as serious as what Foster is going with. And unlike Foster, he didn't have to deal with the, the red flag raising of uh, any semblance of a red flag raise, like IE character issue or, uh, or drug test or any of that nature. So uh, I would say if you, give, if you ask for my thoughts, I would say yes, this was a, a, better, a better pick. Safe pick and possibly a better pick. Definitely, yes. Next question. Question number two. Did Jabril Peppers deserve to be drafted in the first round? It's tough to say, but I mean, when you see players like Pat Holt, what Mahomes and uh, Chubinski going in the first round, as opposed to guys like, like Dalvin Cook, um, having to wait, you know, I'm quite happy that Jabril got his selection that he did, even if it was the Cleveland Browns. I think for a player of his versatility and his skill, his potential, I think it warrants taking a chance on. So I got no problem in admitting, yeah, you know, he he he, did, he deserved that first round selection. So go for Jabril on that one. Yep, I, I think he got lucky. Next question. Question number three: How do you grade the Lions in the? 2017 NFL draft overall overall solid B plus you know I think because I think it's a fair grade to give you took care of some needs you took care of uh, some depth issues on the defensive side of the ball um, you also shored up a couple of project players that could prove to be dividends down the road for your offense um, 
And there it is. It may not have been the, the flashiest looking or the sexiest looking, but it was efficient. You got what you need to have done. So a fair B plus, a high B plus is what I would give, like an 88, 89. That would be my type of rating or grade uh, for, for, for the Lions on this one. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Very comfortable grade, very comfortable picks by Bob Quinn. Nice ring to it. Next question. Question number four, are the Tigers starting to tank early, or is it just Miguel Cabrera and J.D. Martinez being injured? I think it's waiting on Miggy and J.D. I mean, yeah. it, the pitching, the bullpen it is what it is. We knew about how bad they were going to be going into it, so we can't act too surprised how it's acting now. We only be begrudgingly uh, angered at how ineffective they are, but that's all we can do because no matter what we do, we, we can't seem to try to fix the damn bullpen. Other than that, I think our offense is doing quite well as it can be with knowing with two essential vital pieces um, out currently of injury. So see guys like uh, Castellanos and Justin Upton and you know even a fucking guys like Aducci and John Hicks stepping up, uh, it's quite welcome sight to see. So that knowing when you get your stars back with their added addition, um, it will make things quite well. Like I said, you're only two games behind Cleveland for the overall lead at this point, and you're doing this without J.D. and Mickey. Watch what happens when they come back. You never, you never know what could happen. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Jim Adusi and John Hicks could could very well be uh, backup players behind Miguel Cabrera and J.D. Martinez. Possibly the way the way they keep playing. Yeah, and finally, next question. Last second change to question number five. If you were the Tigers' manager, and and by the way, uh, Brian Osmus' decisions to play uh, Victor Martinez, uh, not to, along with with the bullpen issues, including Kyle Ryan and Francisco Rodriguez, Brian Osmus hitting Victor Victor Martinez fourth continuously. Brad Osmus continues to be an idiot. But question number five, if you were the Tigers manager, which spot in the starting batting lineup would you play designated hitter Victor Martinez? I'd bet, bet no him either seventh or eighth. No higher than six. I would welcome to seventh, maybe even eighth. Six, seven, or eighth. I won't bet him ninth because I'm paying him all that damn money. He's got to be in some sort of, of spot in the lineup. But between six, seven, and eight, I was well, I would place in more than like no higher than six. But uh, uh-uh. one to five, he uh, uh-uh. those are my 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 ribeye guys, the guys I need setting the table, and cleaning it off for me. I can't be- have Victor in there fucking it up. To be fair, I pick seven spot in the lineup. That's fine enough, but for me, no higher than six. After that, then you're just asking for trouble. Yeah, Victor Martinez what? should have to retire after next year. And I'm only doing it six because, you know, Miggy and J.D. are hurt. When they come back, I'm placing his ass even lower. Yeah. Yeah, and then when J.D. Martinez and Miguel Cabrera come back up, the lineup should be Kinsler, Castellanos, Cabrera, J.D. Martinez, Upton. Let me think. Uh, Tyler, Col- you- Tyler Collins, Victor Martinez, Jose Iglesias, uh, Al- Alex Avila, and Jose Iglesias. If you really want to be more practical, you know, since everybody else is doing it, bat Miggy second. I mean, you're seeing some of the some of the teams okay. uh, they're batting, they're putting the best hitter in the second hole. You know, Mike Trout, for instance, he's batting second, I'm sure. Uh, Bryce Harper, he's probably batting second. So why not do the same for Cabrera? Especially once J.D. gets back, he can be that third guy with J.F. batting fourth, and Castellanos can be five. I, I believe so, yep. So, maybe Kinsler, Cabrera, Collins, J.D. Martinez, Cassianos, Upton, Victor Martinez, Alex Avila, and then Jose Iglesias. That would be the I lineup. Would actually put, nah, when J.D. and Miggy get back, I put Collins 6, V. Mart 7, uh, Avila 8, uh, Iglesias 9, and like I said, 1 through 5 is Kinsler, Miggy, J.D., J.Up., and Nick. Yeah, I have to agree. There we go. So, Kinsler, Miguel Cabrera, J.D., uh, let's see. Justin Upton. Justin Upton, clean up. Cassiano's fifth. Collins, Victor, Avila, Alex Avila, and Jose Iglesias. All right, got the order. So, that's the five questions segment for all the listeners and fans out there. 
If you want to answer those comments, just replay the episode and answer them in the comment bank below this episode. I also listed those five questions so you can read them and answer them with a comment or reply of your own. So, that's any, any, anything else before we sign off? Not so much as that. Um, thank you for giving me the time that I needed uh, last week to get myself adjusted. And uh, thanks for welcoming me back for this week, Taylor. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. You had to, you had to uh, move, move, didn't you? Yeah, that's all. Uh, but uh, I'm getting myself quite adjusted now. So. Yeah, I, I actually had to come to a decision because the Tigers are playing three game series. Uh, Friday through Sunday, for example, mostly. Sometimes Thursday through Sunday too. So the Sunday option is a very good is a very good choice uh, for now, at least, especially with with uh, getting ready to head, head into uh, the real thick of baseball season. Definitely, we're going to do that the entire regular season. So, save, save for special circumstances, because there may be some nights where the Tigers might be doing Sunday night baseball. I believe. So, all you have to take that consideration for some episodes. Absolutely, yep. So, uh, Ed, get some rest. I'll be back on talk show, and then we'll do this again next Sunday night for episode 263. Absolutely. Perfect, Taylor. Take care. Thanks. Yep. So, before we sign off, I want to remind everyone to share this podcast and our entire podcast share this episode and our entire podcast on social media, have their friends share that as well. And, and just uh, promote it as best you can, because I want to tell them that the Michigan sports truth podcast is in search of local advertising sponsors. If anyone has a business that's interested in sponsoring this program, you can follow sport. You can follow sports radio Detroit on Twitter at sports radio D E T sports radio debt and send them a direct message or email them at sports radio Detroit.com in the contact section or email its owner, Roger Castino, Roger Castillo at rogcast 81 at gmail.com. Also, like their Facebook page and join the Facebook group, Sports, Ra- Sports Radio Detroit. And finally, find their podcast available available on iTunes and Podbean. I'm Taylor Phillips. Follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips and like the Facebook page, The Michigan Sports Truth, and join its Facebook group. We'll talk to you next week on episode 263. This has been a presentation in, synchro- in synchronization and association with Sports Radio Detroit. Thanks very much for listening. TTFN, ta-ta for now. Hey, Mr. T.